Anybody got any? Uh... Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo The three modes of nature. Okay, that's a good subject. So that's chapter 40. Do you have a bag of Advita in English? from uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter 14, text number 1. Sri Bhagavan Vacha, Param Bhuya Prabhakshami, Param Bhuya Prabhakshami, Param Bhuya Prabhakshami, Yananam, uh, Yananam, Yananam Uttamam, Yananam Uttamam, Yananam, Yananam Uttamam, Yananam Uttamam, Yad Yad Bhamuyaha Sarve, Yad Yad Bhamuyaha Sarve, Yad Yad Bhamuyaha Sarve, Yad Yad Bhamuyaha Sarve, Yam Sidim Ito Gatihi, Sri Bhagavan Vacha, the Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Param, Param, Transcendental, Uyaha, again, again, Pavakshami, I shall speak. I shall speak. Yananam, Yananam, of all knowledge. Yanam, Yanam, knowledge. Uttamam, Uttamam, the supreme. Yat, which. Yatva, knowing. Munayaha, the sages. Sarve, all. Varam, transcendental. Siddhim, perfection. Itaha, from this world. Gataha, attain. Translation. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, I again shall declare to you this supreme wisdom, the best of all knowledge, knowing which all the sages have attained the supreme perfection. In response, please. The Supreme Personality of God had said, The Supreme Personality of God had said, Again I shall declare to you this supreme wisdom. Again I shall declare to you this supreme wisdom. The best of all knowledge. The best of all knowledge. Knowing which, knowing which, all the sages have attained perfection. All the sages have attained perfection. Support by his divine grace, S. Vakti Padanta Swami, Sri Prabhupada. 
<clears throat> from the seventh chapter to the end of the twelfth chapter, Sri Krishna in detail reveals the absolute truth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now the Lord Himself is further enlightening our journey. If one understands this chapter through the process of philosophical speculation, he will come to an understanding of devotional service. In the 13th chapter, it was clearly explained that by humbly developing knowledge, one may possibly be freed from material entanglement. It has also been explained that it is due to association with the modes of nature that the living entity is entangled in this material world. Now, in the, this chapter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead explains what those modes of nature are, how they act, how they bind, and how they give liberation. The knowledge explained in this chapter is, is proclaimed by the Supreme Lord to be superior to the knowledge given so far in other chapters. By understanding this knowledge, various great sages attain perfection and transferred to the spiritual world. The Lord now explains the same knowledge in a better way. This knowledge is far, far superior to all other processes of knowledge, thus far explained. And knowing this, many attain perfection. Thus, it is expected that one who understands this 14th chapter will attain perfection. Om Yam Timiran Nusya Yam Janam Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasvati Devi Gauravani Pacharane Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Pastachari Satarane So the Bhagavad Gita is split into three sections. The first section is Karma Yoga and it's a practical application of working in this world and ultimately working in Krishna consciousness so that one can become freed from the entanglement of the material world. The middle chapter is the essence of Bhagavad Gita, it's the, uh, which means devotional service. It culminates in the middle, at the end of the ninth chapter with uh, Manmana Baba Madhbhakta, Majusji Manamaskar, that all we should do is just to dedicate our lives to the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so, that we would think that because it's in the middle, it's the essence, therefore uh, this knowledge is the supreme. But here it says that this is knowledge which is better than we've heard. So it's in the 14th chapter. So the, the, the uh, 13 through to uh, 18 are the, <coughs> is the last section, the third section. And so it's like a sandwich, you, when you have a sandwich, you say, uh, you don't say, but I'll have a bread sandwich, do you? You say, I'll have a, you know, whatever's in the middle, a cheese sandwich or a jam sandwich. Uh, so in this way, you know, the middle six chapters are actually the essence, and that's devotional service. The other two are coverings of the middle six chapters, because they're confidential knowledge. Nobody can really understand that it, there's a, a, we all have an individual relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <coughs> Nobody can understand that I'm not this body, that's confidential knowledge. Nobody can understand more confidential knowledge that the Super Soul is accompanying us in our everyday activities. And ultimately, nobody can understand most confidential knowledge that Krishna is a person and he, we can reciprocate with him on a one-to-one -one basis. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> and so, he says some interesting things in this purport. And um, why is the 14th chapter more important than the 9th chapter? And, you know, in one respect, unless we understand the 14th chapter, we can't actually attain the knowledge given in the 9th chapter. That's the, that's the thing is that the 13th chapter is the beginning of, of the last section of the Bhagavad Gita, which is called Gyan, or scientific knowledge. 
you know, understanding things in a, in a deep way, how things work. How to work is the first six chapters, the goal is in the second six chapters, but then there are people who are philosophical, they like to understand things deeply, so this is the last six chapters. And uh, it starts to explain, you know, okay, I'm in this world, how did I get here? You know, what did I ever do wrong? <laughs> And so, you know, it talks about the, the uh, you know, nature of the enjoyer and consciousness. That, you know, there's the material nature, there's the living ent ent entity, and there's this consciousness. And that, you know, misunderstanding things, we're trying to enjoy the material energy. And that uh, <coughs> within the body is the individual soul. And it's the individual soul who's trying to enjoy the material energy, and so he acquires a material body. And then it says that along with it, and then it explains in a little bit of detail about the nature of the individual soul. And then it starts to explain about the, the, the uh, companion of the individual soul, and that's the super soul, or, or Krishna, expanded into everybody's heart as super soul. Um, <coughs> And that to understand this is actually, you know, to see things as they actually are. But what are we going to do about it? <laughs> you know, we, we've got knowledge, but we don't know what to do at this point, do we? And so this 14th chapter is explaining how we're bound in this world, and how by performing the wrong activities we remain bound. That these three modes of nature. And now by using these modes, of, it says, uh, we always think that we're bound by the modes of nature, right? And, but it says in this, in this particular verse, I'll read it to you again. The, the Supreme, Personal, Supreme Personality explains what those modes of nature are and how they act and how they bind and how they give liberation. So we don't really think about that, do we? How the modes of nature give us liberation. I'm sorry. The knowledge explained in this chapter is proclaimed by the Supreme Lord to be superior to the knowledge given so far in other chapters. So, you know, this 14th chapter is explaining how to work in this world philosophically, how, how we work in this world and we become freed from the modes of nature. And by reading them, we can understand our position. We can, as we read on, we'll, we'll find out that, you know, we can see how our activities uh, are actually which modes of nature we're working at this present time. And therefore, we can alter our mode of work. You know, this is for jnanis. We are devotees, right? And uh, if we can understand that we have to perform devotional service, and performing that devotional service is sufficient for a perfection in life, then that, you know, that's enough. But in order to maintain devotional service, we have to know, have some philosophical understanding behind it. And so this is why we read Bhagavad Gita. And when we understand that, then we can explain to others. Because questions will be asked. And if, we, if we've got the answers, they'll become convinced. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it, it's coming to the point of, it explains what the mode of, the different activities in the mode of ignorance, the different activities in the mode of passion, and the different activities in the mode of goodness. And just by reading that section of the Bhagavad Gita, and later in the 18th chapter, it carries on, and a little bit in the 17th chapter with the same things, uh, working the mods, we can see exactly what we're doing wrong. I remember when I first read it, I was before I joined the movement, I was reading through the mods, it was all exciting, you know, mods of nature, wow, what's all this about? And I was reading, and uh, one in the mode of ignorance, he likes to sleep, <laughs> <laughs> he likes to you know, eat and uh, more or less do nothing. I thought, this is great. <laughs> because I'm in the mode of ignorance. 
and then it's an immortal passion. He likes to work hard and get things done and do as much as he can. So, this is all right as well, you know, that's not bad. So, you know, but mode of ignorance has got the edge though at the moment. And then I read about the mode of goodness. It says that, you know, I thought, wow, the mode of goodness is boring. <laughs> I couldn't understand how the mode of, how the mode of goodness was any good to anybody. So that's because I was in the mode of ignorance. <laughs> So immediately, you know, when you take up and start following the process, you can understand, I'm in the mode of ignorance, I've got to do something about it. And then as we're practicing, sometimes we're slipping back into the mode of ignorance, so we can, we can understand that how to perform devotional service. This is why it's actually superior. It's giving us a barometer by which we can go forward in our devotional service and understand what's happening. Even devotees who've been practicing a long time, they don't know what's happening to them, you know. I, I was fired up yesterday, but today, you know, I feel like committing suicide. <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't feel very enthusiastic. <laughs> they don't feel like committing suicide, but you know, it, I don't feel so enthusiastic. And they're bewildered. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you know. And then a devotee has to preach, and Prabhu, you didn't mind. <laughs> you know, if, if, if a devotee is not very advanced in knowledge, that's what he'll say. And that was the, the person who was actually struggling to do my world of good, to hear that, you know. <laughs> but if you can explain that this is what's happening, you know, and this is what you can do about it, and then he's got something positive to actually go forward with. Um, so yeah, the modes of nature, does anybody know anything about electricity? Have we got any engineers here? Put your hands up. All the engineers. <laughs> well, I, I hear that you're getting water, electricity, and all the amenities in this this, this big trough they're uh, building around the uh, temple. Uh, so electricity, when it comes, it comes in. Guess guess how many modes it comes in? It comes in three, three modes. Not a lot of people know that. It comes in, uh, and they, they colour them. Guess what they colour them? They colour them yellow, blue, and red. Yellow is the mode of goodness. Blue is the mode of ignorance. And red is the mode of passion. And it says that, you know, when they come into the house, they take one of these leads and they, they have a neutral wire and this is how you get the, the, you know, the black and the yellow, the black and the uh, blue, I think it is. Um, <clears throat> or the live and neutral. And then you, you work all the things in the house on that. But when you go up a stage into industry, they use all three modes, all three fa phases, they call them. And uh, what can you do with those three phases? Any, anybody idea? Any ideas? What can you do with electricity? You can run like electricity bulbs, you can run ovens, you can run... Uh, you can do everything now. Yeah. Yeah. Heat, cold, or light. Yeah, you can, you can cool a place, you can heat it up, you can make it windy. You can, you know, you can make it... Electronics, you can... Electromagnetic fields. Electro fields. Yeah, and what can you do with that? <laughs> with that, you can suck. That's how you make engines. It's what? Many engines are based on that yeah. because if you call us, magnetic field, the magnetic field can be used to move objects, and that's how an engine works. Yeah, when you when you start to turn the uh, armature, and then the field it, it strikes, <coughs> and it, it actually ca causes a, it causes a flux. And that drives the engine. So you can drive things, hoovers, anything. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the point is, is that with the three modes of nature, it, it's, it's everywhere. The three modes of nature are not only in this body and in the everything we see around. It's in the mind. We're governed by the, and it's in the intelligence. There's not, it's just like, there's not a place in this material world where modes of nature are not working. So similarly, electricity is everywhere. It's in the air. Sometimes you see 
of the aligning. Mm -hmm. So, the, so in the same way, depending on how you use these modes or these phases in electricity, you can do different things, right? So depending on how we use the modes which are governing us, we can actually uh, elevate ourselves or we can degrade ourselves. It's the same thing. So it's important we know what modes to use and uh, how to use them. So this is a great mystery of the modes of material nature, that they're actually our, our, our friend or they can be our, our enemy. <coughs> And this is the modes of nature are to bring us to the point of working in a mode which is actually suitable or conducive to practice devotional service. So in the morning, when we come to Mangalati, we're actually working in the mode of goodness. We're doing the mode of goodness activities. We're rising early, breaking the mode of ignorance. A shower, breaking the mode of ignorance. Then we're going before the deities and then it becomes from the mode of from the mode of goodness, when we come before the deities and we, we chant and we focus body and mind and intelligence on worship, it becomes the pure mode of goodness, our devotional service. And so <coughs> we are performing these activities in a in a time of the day when it's the mode of goodness, morning time. If we do it in the middle of the day, it will be very difficult. So, you know, everything is actually uh, knowing how to use the modes of material nature. And, you know, Srila Prabhupada, he's given a, as a focus by, even if we're not very philosophical, we can still actually work in, with those modes of nature and just by following his instructions. <coughs> but when we're working on that platform, we need association. We need somebody who actually does understand what's happening and they can enthuse us at the right time and put us right. But it's better if we, uh, if we try to understand how they're yeah. working by our own intelligence. And uh, Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, if we try to do that, then he'll, he'll help us. Does anybody know that verse? In, in the seed verse, Bhagavad Gita. 10-10. 10-10. Ten, ten. Ten. If we try to worship Krishna with devotion, then he says, yeah, I'll give you the understanding what you're trying to understand, by which you can actually make progress. So what is devotion? Would anybody like to uh, categorize what devotion means? To serve with love. To serve with love. To serve with, what if we don't have any? You know, we're still likely, you know, when we up for morning, there's, there's, in the morning, we don't feel any love. But we, we do it because, you know, this is what we should do. Do you call it duty first? Duty. Yeah, duty. Yeah. Every single action and thought that you do, in your every single action and thought that you make during the day in surrenderance to Krishna. So every activity you can give to Krishna because everything can be done in the mode of devotion. And so you can surrender everything to Krishna as an act of love for Krishna. Even if you don't feel love, can you still give those actions? Krishna, yeah, in the beginning there's, you know, mode of ignorance means um, <clears throat> we may not do our duty even. Sometimes we come to Mongolati, sometimes we don't. And then after some time, <laughs> you know, then we start to come regularly, so it's duty. So when we're dutiful, it means we're serious. And Krishna accepts that we're surrendering our free will to serve him. So he accepts that as a kind of love. <laughs> uh, so this is what you were saying, duty. And then that duty, we perform it uh, on an ongoing basis. And what happens is that it purifies the heart. As we were saying this morning that our austerities and tapasya are solely to purify the heart 
and you know, free us from the bodily conception of life. And then, as we as we become freed from these material attachments, then our natural inclination to love Krishna starts to, which is in the heart, starts to manifest. And as that grows, it becomes more of a spontaneous love, not just duty. It changes from duty. Right. Okay. Anything else on the modes of nature? You can read on otherwise. Idam Gyanam Pashritya Mam Sadam Sadam Yam Agataha Sare Pino Pajayante Pralaye Na Piatantichai. By becoming fixed in this knowledge, one can attain to the transcendental nature like my own. Thus established, one is not born at the time of creation or disturbed at the time of dissolution. Would somebody else like to read this report? the same for what Maharaj? Four, Two. Two. Okay. After acquiring perfect transcendental knowledge, one acquires qualitative equality with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, becoming free from the repetition of birth and death. One does not, however, lose his identity as an individual soul. It is understood from Vedic literature that the liberated souls who have reached the transcendental planets of the spiritual sky always look to the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, being engaged in transcendental loving service. So, even after liberation, the devotees do not lose their individual identity. Generally, in the material world, whatever knowledge we get is contaminated by the three modes of material nature. Knowledge which is not contaminated by the three modes of nature is called transcendental knowledge. As soon as one is situated in that transcendental knowledge, he is on the same platform as the Supreme Person. Those who have no knowledge of the spiritual sky uh, hold that after being freed, up, freed from the material activities of the material form, this spiritual identity becomes formless, without any variegatedness. However, just as there is material variegatedness in this world, in the spiritual world, there is also variegatedness. Those in ignorance of this think that spiritual existence is opposed to material variety. But actually, in the spiritual sky, one attains a spiritual form. There are spiritual activities and the spiritual situation is called devotional life. That atmosphere is said to be uncontaminated. Un there one is equal in quality with the Supreme Lord. To obtain such knowledge, one must develop all the spiritual qualities. One who thus develops the spiritual qualities is not affected either by the creation or by the destruction of the material world. <coughs> yes, yeah, so even in this world, people of different... Uh, backgrounds and different inclinations, they don't mix so easily. You know, to act to or people from different orders in life. A person who's, you know, for instance, a person who's educated uh, in in the sciences, it's very difficult for him to mix with somebody who's not so educated because that's his you know, that's his way of dealing with people. A uh, person who was brought up in, you know, a high class or materially high class family, they'll find it difficult to mix with somebody who was, you know, on a low class family because he's conditioned that way. Right? Like, on a, in a better way, um, a person who's pious and, uh, what can you say, is truthful and 
law abiding, he'll find it difficult to mix with with outlaws, people, thieves and rogues. They just, you know, they're incompatible. And so similarly, if, you know, to, to actually associate in the spiritual world, and especially to associate with the Supreme Lord, we have to develop the same qualities so that the so that the relationship is, uh, you know, is compatible. It'll be difficult. It, it'll be difficult for us to, even if we went back to the spiritual world. You know, well, in my present condition, I can't talk about anybody else. I wouldn't be able to function there because they function on such a high level. Even when we first come to devotional service, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little different from what we do, our dealings outside. And it's a little, we feel a little awkward. Uh, so in, in the same way, but gradually as we associate with devotees, uh, we start to imbibe their qualities. Purusha prakriti stohi, mukti prakriti jangan, karanagana sangasya, sadasat jangan yonishu. By going through this world and associating with certain people, will develop a certain mentality. So, association of devotees, we usually say we hear from them, right? We hear from devotees, but no, it's also association, personal association. By personal association, we actually practically learn how to uh, apply devotional service or apply devotional service in a practical way. Um, so this is another reason why we, we, are, we try to associate with devotees, especially devotees who are more experienced. Because then we, we don't have to uh, learn the hard way if we're a little bit submissive to, you know, following them, then very quickly we, we can uh, adapt the process of devotional service. It would mean a little bit of uh, austerity on our part. You know, we're used to doing things a certain way, but then we decide to do it the other way. Has anybody had that experience when they come to the temple for the first time? That there's, uh, it's like it, you feel a little bit awkward, <laughs> to say the least, <laughs> you know. What I mean? And the language that the devotees may use if they're not so thoughtful. <laughs> Excuse me, Prabhu, <laughs> we're going to respect Prashadam, you know. <laughs> What's he talking about? <laughs> Only word I understood there was, Excuse me. <laughs> So we have to talk. We have to talk like you know what people can understand. So everything's there in the spiritual world. It's not everything we're doing here is more or less the same as what's happening in the spiritual world. But there's a different consciousness. In the material world, everybody's centering their, it's called, uh, they're centering their activities around themselves and their associates, family, then extended family and city, then country and some people they're very uh, altruistic they uh, they like to do good for the whole world but it's still centered around my 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 this my that my world <coughs> but in the spiritual world everybody's centering everything around uh, Krishna and therefore the whole thing changes its its quality <coughs> The, the, only, the only wrong thing with doing things in the material world is that we, we do things for ourselves. And if we, if we learn the art of doing things for others, then this is called moral, moral activities. So when we're, when we're young, our parents will bring us up to, to share things and give. 
So this is helping us to come to a point of ultimately being able to share things with Krishna. Uh, <coughs> so this is what this particular verse says. Any questions on that? Yeah. So in this case, can you say that the people who are in the material world and who are doing charity, charitable activities, humanitarian activities, are well situated since they are doing things for others? People who are, you mean people who are, who are um, giving in the material world? Is that what you're saying? Yes. People, are they better than who? Because you said the only difference is that people in the material world, they do things for themselves and not for others. Unlike in the spiritual world, a uh, spiritual life. So does it mean that people who are not sin uh, necessarily spiritual, like their activities are actually centered around doing things for others, as in charity or humanitarian activities, are they well situated in that case? <coughs> no, ulti ultimate, ultimately, it's not. It's not well situated because. Uh, you know, the, the goal is to, you know, centre our life around service to God in that respect. But it's better to actually start to do those things because they're more of goodness activities. And then it'll be easier to actually, you know, start to centre our life around giving to Krishna. But it's not guaranteed. Because you know, we may be doing it for so many <coughs> reasons and that attachment to why we're doing it is also maybe got pride, feeling better than others. We may have a strong false ego. So it doesn't matter what situation we are in this world, the main thing is to understand the situation and then start to work at you know, the process of devotional service and then from wherever we are, whether we're completely selfish or we're more giving in an altruistic way, uh, then, you know, it'll work. It, it, it does appear, actually, that when we meet people, when we do both, yeah? Um, reading the chapter, Prasadashi writes in the that people who have a lot of goodness but who have not completely surrendered to Krishna yet, they will be born in a body again where they will have lost money. And often, if they do not surrender to Krishna, they will spend that money on building schools, building hospitals, doing charity, etc. But those people, they will only be relegated to Krishna if they surrender themselves to Krishna. Because we talk, always talk about three modes, but there's a fourth mode. And the fourth mode is detached from the three modes. And that's when you completely surrender to Krishna. And so those people who aren't up to most, who have not really returned to Krishna yet, they will be born in a body where there are no wealthy family, and they get the opportunity to use that money to give to Krishna if they surrender to Krishna. So those people are in a small subclass, but they cannot go back to Krishna yet. Rather, they more likely will go to heaven with time. Yeah, we meet people, if you do, Sankirtan, you know, you go out and you distribute books and, uh, you know, sometimes people stop and you start talking to them and uh, you think, wow, this person, you know, is so elevated, he's, he's giving, he's, you know, he, he's probably, uh, you know, a doctor and he gives to charity and he's very, you know, he's, he's probably, um, you know, interested in, uh, you know, helping people in so many ways, besides, you know, and you think, wow, this person's so elevated. But the point is, is what's the motivation? And uh, that's the key. It's not what we do, it's the motivation behind it. And even as a devotee, Krishna knows our motivation. And, you know, it's not that we, we start to practice devotional service. Uh, for the for the right for the right reason or the pure reason in the beginning, but gradually we start to be able to appreciate by the association of devotees and by Krishna's uh, help that you know we, we we maybe have to improve and start to change our consciousness.
Okay. Well, it's five to now. Is there any more questions? We could read on. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's about, I uh, think about the first, uh, like, what were you saying about uh, in the beginning of the process, uh, we do... You can speak over. Yeah, in the beginning of the devotional process, that we do something more about uh, duty, and how do we develop faith, because <coughs> we, and when there is a lot of disturbances, and how, if you can share for me your personal... Can you, you speak up a little bit? Yeah, like... So about the devotional process, yeah. like how in the beginning it may be Duty. difficult, sorry? Yeah, carry on. Yeah, and then how do you develop faith, and then, uh, like you said, that uh, if you follow the process, even if it's by duty, then slowly, like Krishna reciprocates, and then, yeah. Yeah. If you can share that from your personal Yeah, Krishna reciprocates every time we make an effort. But we can't stay on the same platform. It, it, if it keeps reciprocating with the same effort, it means we won't go forward. You know what I mean? We'll find that we get a strong reciprocation when we make a right choice. And then, uh, you know, after some time we feel that the, the reciprocation may not feel so strong. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have to, you know, um, we have to consider why that is. Well, we don't even have to consider why it is. If we keep in the association of devotees and analyse the way they're performing devotional service and the way we're performing devotional service, we'll start to see some uh, uh, discrepancies in our own devotional service. And then we, we make adjustments. And sometimes we get, you know, if we've got a trusted friend, they'll give us some idea as well. And then we move up to, and then we feel some, you know, reciprocation. But it's like that. We're getting reciprocation all the time, otherwise we couldn't m maintain ourselves in this situation. It's just that we become accustomed to it, and we, we're creatures of habit. It's very difficult, you know. We, it's difficult for a person to uh, enth enthuse themselves all the time and keep pushing themselves into it, you know. So, in the association of devotees, we get that inspiration from seeing others and from, you know, the interaction that we have with them. It's like in a gym, you know, all the ma all the messages go for a, you know, <laughs> you go for an ease up in the gym to get some weight off, and you, you know, you encourage one another, get those knees up, so and so. Um, so it's like that. It's like, you know, it, it, when, we're, when we're six months old, you know, and uh, you start to try and talk, or, or when you say, I don't know what age kids start walking at, but, you know, say if you're two or something like that, and you start to walk, and as soon as you start to walk, you know, all the family are like, whoa, they're all clapping, and encouraging you, whoa, and the child's like, enjoying the encouragement. But when he gets to 16, you know, he doesn't expect the same reciprocation, you know what I mean? <laughs> he has to do a little bit more at that age. Okay, we'll stop there. Kantara Shrima Bhagavad Gita Ki Jaya Prabhupada Ki Jaya 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 Jaya